Welcome. Uh, let's see. Let me bring this up real quick. Welcome. This is the first lecture in logic design. And uh, uh, I'm Dr. Paul Morton, and I'll be your instructor. Um, so let me introduce myself a little bit, and then, uh, then I want to talk about the syllabus. We'll talk about some of the stuff on Blackboard, and then uh, I'm going to go ahead and get into Unit 1 a little bit. Uh, we may finish a little bit earlier today. I don't know. We'll try. I may only do this for about uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, so let me just first say, I, so, I, so I, I am a, well, I started off uh, as an undergraduate at Purdue. I did my undergraduate, my BS EE at Purdue. And then uh, I was in ROTC, and it was during the Vietnam era. So I uh, went into the Army, became an infantry officer, airborne ranger, and went to helicopter school, and then was sent straight to Vietnam to fly helicopters and also spent some time with the infantry there. I came back, I did about a year at Fort Leonard Wood, and then um, I went to the University of Missouri. I, actually, initially, my idea was I thought about being a full-time Christian worker, but after a year, I really felt uh, that what I needed to do is go back uh, and, and uh, go to graduate school. So I did. I got my master's, started working on my PhD. Uh, in the process of working on my PhD, I did some, uh, it was in kind of a bioengineering program within the electrical engineering department. And uh, I did start, uh, I, I got involved in some, uh, some medical imaging work. We were uh, using computers to analyze medical images. Um, and uh, so I started, uh, I, so I was allowed to take some, uh, some related courses. So I took, a, I took a nursing physiology course and then I took a, 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 a neural anatomy course uh, and got very interested in the medical school side of things. And so I started applying medical school. Um, I got into medical school, and during my time at medical school, I continued to work on my PhD and uh, and also medical school. And then I graduated from medical school in June and uh, started residency at Wash U, and uh, and finished up my uh, wrote my thesis and defended it that uh, that internship year. So. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, kind of my background. Uh, when I was in residency, I became I uh, wound up going back in the military, went in the Air Force this time, and spent 21 years in the military as a physician. Uh, during part of those years, uh, a couple years I just did OB at a small base, and then I went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where I did engineering three days a week, and I did medicine two days a week. So that was, that was kind of a nice break. Uh, and I didn't have to pull any call, and uh, I just had a handful of uh, special patients that I uh, delivered their babies, and then one day a week I would do urodynamics and see patients in clinic, and then one day a week I would operate with the residents, and um, uh, and then three days a week I did uh, I did engineering stuff, and then about once a month, once or one month or two months a year I would deploy with the test wing um, uh, to various uh, far flung places on the clan on the planet. Um, then I moved down to San Antonio uh, and did nine years down here, uh, uh, basically as chairman of the OBGYN department. And uh, during that time, uh, towards the end of that time, I, I was recruited to teach logic design at UTSA. I still, to this day, don't know how they got my name. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. And then when I got out of the military um, and went into private practice, I continued to teach courses at UTSA. And uh, along with that, um, uh, they kind of started twisting my arm to do a little more. And, uh, and so I said, when I closed my private practice, I would, I would consider going full time. Uh, and so I did. And uh, in 2013, I closed my practice and became a full time, non tenure track uh, 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 professor. And so now I am, uh, now I'm, my rank is professor in practice, I'm non tenure track. Uh, which means I don't do a lot of research. I primarily just teach classes. I'm what's called an NTT. Uh, and uh, I do this because it's, it's kind of my, you know, kind of my last job. Uh, and uh, I really do enjoy teaching. I have really uh, enjoyed my years here. But I have, I have taught logic design now since 2001 pretty much continuously. 
Uh, I think there was a semester or two break somewhere there, uh, right near the end of my time in the Air Force. But um, so so that's kind of where I am, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, this is a course I know very well. I try really hard to change it up every year and make it more interesting. Uh, and uh, I hope that you'll agree that this is uh, that you'll enjoy this course. I have had a number of former students. I also teach microprocessors one, microprocessors two, digital systems design, and I'm also involved with the EPICS program, which you should definitely look into and uh, consider whether you'd like to be a uh, part of that or not. Um, it's kind of the replacement for senior design, but it involves students in every year group, uh, not just seniors, but also freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. And you have to do at least a little bit of, you have to do one or two hours at least as a uh, as a freshman, sophomore, junior, or you won't be able to do it as a senior. Uh, and I think you, you might find it to be really interesting, although it's not for everybody. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and, um, so that, that's me, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about uh, my philosophy. My, my goal is for every one of you to get an A in this class. And if you do the work, you will get an A. I don't, I don't uh, have some cutoff. Uh, but unfortunately, not everybody puts in the effort. And then some people may have a little more ability than others. But I will tell you this, if you work hard, uh, you, I, you, I know because of your, the fact you're sitting here that you have the ability to get an A in this course. Uh, so if you work hard enough and apply yourself, you can do that. Um, and I would just challenge you to consider doing that. Uh, also, this is very foundational material. Uh, if you do anything in the area of digital design, you will, uh, you will, you will use this material. Uh, it is the foundation of all logic design. And you really can't understand logic design without this information. So I really encourage you. It also will help you uh, whether you're doing uh, microcontrollers or uh, whether you're doing uh, uh, really anything, but especially if you're doing uh, using hardware description languages to create uh, to design hardware like integrated circuits or programmable logic, uh, you will find this absolutely crucial. Um, in fact, in uh, the digital systems design course, the very first thing we do. Uh, well, it's not the first thing, it's the second thing we do. We, uh, we get started on Verilog and then we back up and we do a review of logic design because it's foundational. And uh, students tend to slip a little bit uh, over the summer or year and so we, we do a little review. Okay, um, with that, let me, let me talk a little bit about the syllabus. Um, let's see, where which one is it? It's here, there. Okay, so this is the syllabus. Uh, it, it, this, this, this is the first semester I've used this template, uh, which the template itself was about 32 pages, and I think it's about 30 pages the way it's laid out here now. Uh, well, maybe 22, something like that. I guess it's, no, 30 pages. Uh, and this, this, should, uh, this should work as, a, as an index, um, so you can flip to the page uh, that's related. You will see the course schedule and outline is here. Week one through week uh, 16, there's really, only, uh, there's really only 15, well, there's maybe 14 weeks. And then the 15th week, we'll do our final exam. Let's see, let me shrink this down. So, yeah, so you can still see me. Yeah, perfect. And I'll pull this over so it doesn't distract too much. Okay. So we're gonna go, we're gonna cover a few of these things. Um, you probably should read through this. It's got a lot of information. Uh, so there are a lot of links that you can click on. You don't have to go read all the links. Some of this is public health information, Corona Task Force. So let me just say right off the bat, uh, we have three types of courses at UTSA this semester. Uh, we have courses that are fully online, asynchronous, which means you can do it all online and nothing is rigidly scheduled so you can so it's you you don't have to look at a video at, that say it's posted at nine you don't have to look at it at nine in the morning you can look at it that evening or maybe the next day but there is a time window you have to do it in and for my for this course you have uh, it's going to be on a weekly basis so all the videos for the week you have to have watched by uh, by Saturday evening 
at the end of the week, by Saturday at midnight, 11.59 actually. Uh, so the video on Friday, you really only have two days to look at it. The video on Monday, you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and all day Saturday to get it done. For most videos, there will be a post-video quiz. And uh, we'll talk about uh, that. But each one of those quizzes is worth uh, two-tenths of a course point. So every five quizzes is one course point. So you don't want to blow these off. Uh, you don't have to get them all right, but, it, but you, need, need to, you need, need to shoot to get half the questions right on the quiz. If you get half the questions right, then, and I'll probably try and make it an even number, um, if you get half the questions right, then you will um, uh, you, then you will get full credit for the quiz. You'll get the two tenths of a course point. If you miss, if you get less than half, you will not get the two tenths. The quiz can only be taken once. They're all online. Uh, you only get to see one question at a time. You can't back up, and you do have a time limit on uh, how much time you have to take it. Although that time limit may uh, may be increased if you uh, if you uh, uh, have uh, a, a disability with disability services. Uh, all right. So, um, so there's really no attendance requirements at all. There's nothing you have to attend. Even the all the all the exams will be online. The final will be online. All the quizzes are online. All the lectures are online. There will be uh, some. Uh, potentially synchronous things uh, because uh, you, I will have you do one group project and in that group project uh, you'll have to get together with uh, four or five other students and you'll have to work up uh, one of the combinational design problems at the end of chapter eight and you'll have to prepare some PowerPoints uh, and a, a computer-based simulation you'll have to uh, kind of rehearse a little bit so you give a reasonable presentation and the idea is that you'll do this presentation on Zoom live. But you don't have to. If you don't want to do that, then you can, re you can pre record it on video and uh, then you can uh, upload that recorded video um, to a. Uh, uh, I probably will put a link on Blackboard. I may have you just send it to me. So when we get to that time, I'll be more specific about that. Um, but I would like you to do it online because we'll invite the other students to uh, also to to join Zoom and to, and to watch you do it online. And I may even have um, some communication students also review the video or review your online presentation and give you some on some real time feedback on things you could have done better, things you did that were really good, uh, just based on not the content technically, but the communication parts uh, like the color scheme on your slides, uh, your speaking style, how many filler words you use, like um and ah and like and things like that. And those are very helpful. We've done this live normally. Last semester we didn't do it because of COVID, but uh, we've done it, I think, maybe six or seven other semesters. So I, it's so valuable, and this is about the only chance you really get to work on your presentation skills that I'm going to try and make it work this semester. We'll see. I don't have it set up yet. Um, but I will tell you that sometimes your future potential in a company uh, does really depend on uh, how good your presentation skills are uh, when on the rare occasion your boss's boss and, their, and his boss or her boss uh, shows up uh, for a briefing you're giving. And if you do a really, you know, knock them over kind of job, uh, then, then People have their eye on you and a little more interest in your career. Looking uh, when they ne when the next time they have an opening uh, to move you up. Whereas if you flop like a dud and you're very uninspiring and your presentation so style really sucks, you're probably not going anywhere. So this is something you should work on. Uh, so that's why we do these group presentations, and uh, it's also a good experience working with a group because you'll find a lot of projects through the semester. Uh, there'll be group projects and other courses you know, through your through your time here at UTSA, and then your senior design project. You'll have a team of seniors. Uh, even if you do epics, you'll still have a team with seniors and underclassmen on it, and uh, and you will begin to earn a reputation of what kind of team player you are. 
Are you the one that dumps the work on everybody else and doesn't do your part and then tries to take credit at the end? Or are you the one that, uh, that takes on the hard tasks and shows real leadership and inspires and encourages the other students and how, you know, the one that really kind of, kind of is a natural leader. And when you, when you begin to manifest those characteristics, you become an attractive commodity among your peers. And that's also true in your working day. So this is a good time to work on some of those things as well. All right. So that's why we do the group project. And I will tell you, uh, every single class I've ever taught, uh, many, many students have commented in the written evaluations that it was the highlight of the course. They got the, that's when things really clicked. And because I, that's true, and, I, and many students have told me that, uh, I, we will get these done before we give the second midterm because these would be the skills you need to do well in that midterm. And if we do these after the midterm, then you may not develop these skills until you've gotten your group project done and oh, it's too late, you already screwed up your midterm. So uh, the second midterm, not the first one. Uh, okay, this course really is in three parts. Um, the first part is has to do with number theory, codes, uh, the definition of digital versus analog, kind of uh, the introduction of the concept of switching algebra and the theorems that switching algebra allows us to use, uh, all of which have sort of followed down from work done by George Boole. And then there's a couple other players in that, uh, in that cascade, uh, which we may talk about as we get to them. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me go through this briefly. There's a few things in here I want to point out. Uh, first, here's my contact information. It is also on Blackboard. If we, if we go to Blackboard, uh, you'll see uh, this is the Blackboard link, and my contact information is right down there. My home address, my cell phone, and uh, I think my office, well, it's, it's, in, it's, in the, uh, it's in here anyway. So it's in BSC 1.538. However, uh, my office hours this semester at the start, um, this is the baseline, we're going to do it on Zoom. And they will be every Monday uh, from, 12, from noon to 1. Every Monday, noon to 1 on Zoom. And here are the dates, starting with August 24th, today. And every week until November 30th, and then there won't be one in December because we're done. We have one class meeting, I think, in December. Uh, here is the link. You just copy this link right here and put that in your browser, and you'll be in the meeting. You can do that a little before noon, and then I'll probably check on right at noon, and then uh, you can participate. Uh, there will be other classes in here. I may change it up eventually if that's a real problem. Um, so we'll, we may switch from logic design to micro one to DSD. I think you might find some of that interesting. Uh, I will have specific help sessions for logic design students only other days, but these are my office hours. So if you just want to talk to me about something, and then if we want to be private, uh, we can. Uh, I hopefully will be able to set it up so we can go into a breakout room, talk, and then we can go back to the main room and everything will be cool. Uh, and then the next person can have their turn. So we'll see. We'll see if that works. Um, that's the idea anyway. Okay. Let's see. Um, so, um, all right. So equipment. Really, uh, you don't, there's no special equipment required. Let me go back to the syllabus and let me bring back up the camera. Um, so if you... Let me, I'll make this bigger here. So anyway, so no special equipment. Um, communication, yeah. I, so if you, when you, if you need to communicate with me, here's what I want you to do. Uh, you have my cell phone number. Don't call me because I, I don't answer the phone if it's a number I don't recognize. And that's because all these, uh, all these marketing people, even though we're on the do not call list, and all the political parties... Uh, send me call me all the time and uh, and so and they spoof local numbers now so it'll come up as a 210 number but it's it's from you know East Jerusalem looking looking for a donation for you know for I don't know for cobblestones or something it's crazy so uh, so what you should do is either send me an email 
or if it's really emergent, you can send me a text message. I do check. I do check the text te text messages fairly frequently. I I would prefer not to not to get text messages from my students on the weekend, but if it's a crisis, you can do that. Um, and uh, you can, if you send me an email, uh, I do check the. I'll try and check the email Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I may not check it Saturday, Sunday. Um, so if you send something late Friday night, and I I may not check it till late late Monday, which means you may not hear from me until Tuesday. Uh, so, but I promise to get back within about one 24-hour business day, uh, as long as it's you know during working hours, more or less. So, so either an email or text me. Uh, don't send the email to the Blackboard email system. Send it to uh, the email address that's, that I posted right here, paul.morton at utsa.edu. It's also on the Blackboard right there. Um, not right there. Let's see, is it down there? Yeah, right there. So that's the email to use. Uh, doesn't have to be capitalized, doesn't matter. It's, it's case insensitive for emails. All right. So, um, let's see, what else? Um, so it is a, is a three hour course with one recitation session. Now, I have not talked to the uh, TA yet, uh, or maybe briefly, I, I not 100% certain. I think I have the same TA as last time. Um, and I do have his name up. Uh, no, I didn't put it up yet, or did I? No, but I will. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one anyway. Let me fix this. Yeah, I thought I did have the TA's name. Yeah, is the Dong Gal is a TA, and so um, so that's his email address, and uh, so. I don't know. I haven't talked to him about how he's going to do it yet, so we'll see. But hopefully, uh, hopefully he'll he'll have Zoom sessions for the recitation section. He he probably can have a couple per week. I don't know. There there. I think their schedule and schedule maybe five or six recitations. He probably won't do that many, but he'll probably do three or four since since most students are not going to have too many competing things, and he may do even some of them in the evening to make it easy for people to get online. So here's here's the actual, here's your course. Uh, and here's here's the link for the Zoom meeting. It's the exact same link right there. And there are all the dates starting starting Monday, 24th. Okay. Um, all right, and then here. Okay, so, so it is a three hour course with a one hour recitation. So we'll have three lecture hours per week and they'll all be uh, online asynchronous. All the tests will be online and the only thing that will be a little goofy is the Zoom help sessions will be scheduled. You don't have to do them but uh, they're going to be live obviously so if you want to participate you will have to participate at the scheduled times. I will try and do one in the day and one in the evening uh, most weeks um, and I'll probably um, Probably ask what 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 times would be most convenient for everybody. We'll see it. We'll see how that plays out. Okay. Um, now, uh, yeah. So here are the course objectives. Uh, we have the text listed somewhere here. Let's see. Textbook. So the textbook is uh, is the Roth uh, uh, Charles Jr. And it's called Fundamentals of Logic Design. It's, it's actually Roth and Kenny, I think. Um, Fundamentals of Logic Design, 7th edition. The 6th edition will be also fine. Even the 5th edition is probably workable. But the, 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 the problem sets will be based on the 7th edition. And one of the things they did in the, in the difference was between the editions is they moved the problems around. Uh, that was probably intentional to get people to buy the new editions. Um, Anyway, that's how it is. Um, okay, so uh, I do want you to have a good camera, a, a good computer with a with a working web camera. 
Uh, if you don't have, if your computer's camera is broken or doesn't have one, uh, spend the 15 bucks and get a web camera so you can, uh, so you can have the video. When we do Zoom, I really would like to see your smiling faces. It it's bad enough to be on Zoom, where it's kind of impersonal, but it's really bad when nobody turns on their video. It drives me crazy. Um, I like to see your smiling faces. It really does help. So please get a webcam and please, please try and use your webcam. Let's see, maybe I'll just turn that off. I probably don't really need that. Okay. Um, what else? Let's see. Uh, so I think most, a lot of, okay, grades. Um, yeah. Oh, equipment. So you don't need any special equipment for this course. There is an, an associated logic design lab course, but uh, this is not it. It's a separate course taught by uh, 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 Patrick Benavides. Uh, so not by me. Patrick's a great guy. You'll probably enjoy it, but uh, but it's not my course, and so there's no special hardware. Um, so there will be a quiz after each video, and you can complete the quiz whenever you want. However, what I encourage you to do is open the quiz, uh, start the, well, uh, the quiz, I think I'll make the quiz time about 20 minutes. So you should start the video, watch part of it, and then uh, when you get the the video mostly watched, you can uh, you can look at doing the quiz. It'll only be four, five, or six questions. So, uh, but you you uh, it'll help you. It'll probably help you to maybe have them open at the same time. I don't know. Um, I generally do make the quizzes so you so you can't back up, um, and the questions are usually randomized. But um, but see if you can you know uh, you, you should. I will definitely answer the question in the, in the, in the video. So uh, if you just pay pretty good attention, you should be able to do them. If we have a lot of trouble with students scoring badly on them, which was a problem last semester, um, uh, I guess I'll try and make them a little easier. Or maybe I'll let you go back and forth. But I, you know, as soon as I do that, I know, you know there'll be a lot of uh, assistance. But they only, cause, they only count 0 .2, 0 0.2 point, course points each. So uh, if you do 25 of them, you'll get the full five points. If you do more, if, if I say have 35 of them in the semester, uh, then you have the chance to get uh, a couple of extra points. So there's, a, there's opportunities for extra credit here. And all you have to do is get half the questions right to get full credit. You'll, there'll be one group presentation. It's worth six course points. And you'll be doing it in groups of four or five students. There'll be one uh, Quinny McCluskey quiz which will kind of, it's kind of like a mini test, and it's worth four course points. There'll be uh, 13 homework sets or so. Uh, I, may, uh, I may dump the last one or replace it with something. And you, have, you, you, get, two points, uh, you get two points for each one of those, um, uh, up to a total of 20. Uh, I don't know if I'll allow extra credit for that. Uh, I probably won't, but... Uh, but if you get at least 50% of the homework on 10 homeworks, you'll get the full 20 points. So you can miss three homeworks, uh, and that's fine. So do all the homeworks, and you shouldn't have any problem getting your 20 points, uh, which is a, that's a nice boost. One of, the, one of the reasons students get C's in this course is they didn't do their homework. That's, that's not wise. Uh, and you'll find that the homework will help you. You have, uh, there's a, there, there'll be turn-in dates. They're already on the syllabus, but they'll, they'll also be on Blackboard in the turn-in folder. And um, I don't have an update of that yet, but I will. Uh, and those turn-in dates, uh, you, can, you, you need to turn it in by 11.59, the date that, that it's due. If you miss that, you'll get half off, up to a week. If you miss that, you'll get zero. The link will go away and you will not be able to turn in your homework. Now, every semester, I have students ask me if they can turn homework in after the week of lateness. Last semester, last spring, I allowed students to do this because I felt sorry for them, and there were some legitimate COVID, uh, COVID crises. But it's been a long time since spring. We've been in this COVID thing since the second week of March, and um, it, this is plenty of time for people to make adjustments. So I expect you to be fully prepared to do this course. 
in a timely manner. And since everything is asynchronous, you, you basically just have to get it done within the week. There's really no, and, and on the homework, it's assigned, it's assigned now at the very beginning. So you know right from day one when it's due, there's no excuse for turning in late, but I'll let you turn in it up to a week late. But, but after that, there's, you're done. Don't even bother to ask. I will not let you turn it in. The only exceptions will be if you're in some sort of a vehicle accident or serious illness and you're in the hospital and you have a doctor's note or, you know, your mother or father dies or one of your siblings and you have to go to the funeral. Those are, those are uh, you know, horrible circumstances, which I hope nobody experiences. But if you do, then we'll cut you plenty of slack. If you really have a problem, we will cut you slack. But if you just didn't do it because you were lazy... I will, I, will, I will appreciate your honesty when you tell me that you have no excuse, but that's the bottom line. You have no excuse. And so, and this is all to say that if you do the homework when it's due, you get the benefit of it when you are supposed to get the benefit. When you wait to the end of the course and try and do all the homework in the last week, it doesn't really serve its purpose. It's, it's kind of useless. And not only that, it's really unfair to the grader to dump all that on him at the end of the semester when he's trying to take, or she is trying to take final exams. It's, it's unfair to me because I can't, I have no feel for how you're doing as you go through the course. And, uh, and it, makes, it makes putting the grades in at the end very difficult when I have students bugging me trying to, trying to add scores uh, for stuff they should have done uh, you know, weeks or months earlier. So do your homework on time or live with consequences. There will be two midterms and a final. They will be online. The midterms will count 17 and a half points each and the uh, final will count 30 points. For the midterms, I will give you a practice midterm to take online that, well, I may have you take it, uh, I may have you take it offline and then we'll, we'll we may, then we'll, I'll go through and grade it in the videos. Um, and I'll show you, I'll work the problem so you see what, how, what you should have done if you didn't miss anything. Um, but the actual test will be online. They will be, they will be timed, so you only have so much time. If you're uh, registered with disability services, you may have more time. The, the problems, uh, uh, they will be randomized, so there'll, be, so there'll probably be 30 questions, uh, like for the final. I don't, I don't know about the midterm. Uh, and, uh, or maybe more, I don't know, I don't remember. But anyway, there'll be some number, let's say 30, 30 questions, and they'll be randomized, and the answers will be random as well. You will not be able to back up, so you'll get the test question, and uh, you'll have to answer it, and once you answer it, you can never go back to it. So I do that because it just takes away some of the incentive to take the test with one of your buddies on the telephone and comparing answers, you won't be able to do that um, because you won't get the same questions and you'd have to remember all the questions and write them all down. And there's adequate time, but if you spend a lot of time doing that, you may not get your test done. So so that's just an attempt that, you know, since everything's offline uh, or online uh, asynchronous, it makes it really fairly difficult to, uh, to police it and so this just discourages that as much as we can. And I understand people can still cheat. It's basically an open book test, right? You can, you can look at any notes. You can look at your book. Uh, I don't have any problem with that at all. Uh, but I just don't want you doing the work for somebody else or having somebody else do your work. Uh, so do your own work, but it's basically open book. But they will be presented random, no backing up, with randomized answers. So you can't say for question five I got six. It won't. Your question five won't be the same question five. And even if you knew if you had the same question five, the answer six wouldn't be the same answer six. So uh, although it's hard to randomize it, true false, but there'll be true false questions. There'll be multiple choice. There'll be multiple choice with one correct answer. Multiple choice with multiple correct answers. There may be a fill in the blank. There may be uh, numeric answers. Uh, there's about I don't know, there's about 10 different or so formats or questions, and I, I use as many as make sense. Um, and then um, that's it. 
and that adds up to 100. Okay, uh, I just give letter grades, A, B, C, D, F. Um, so if you're having major problems with the course, you should come talk to me. Don't just stop coming to class. Get out of the course and take a, take a W, which doesn't count as an F. There's no reason to get an F in the course. Uh, really, I only give Fs for people who don't do the course. Uh, I mean, if you, if you come to every class, take all the tests, you, you might get a D, but you won't get an F. Now, a D still doesn't really help you a lot, uh, but I might give you a C- minus if you, if you can you know, do some makeup work and we can figure something out. I generally do let students do corrections on their, on their tests. I don't know how to do it this semester because I like to do those in person. But if you really bomb one of the tests, don't drop the course and panic. Uh, come, to, come to office hours and meet with me, uh, and we'll, 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 we'll look at your test, and we'll try and, uh, we'll try and uh, figure out uh, where you messed up and we'll see if we can't get you back on the right track. Most of the time, I, I'll let you bump the test score up to, a, to, maybe, a, a, to maybe a 70. Even if you get like a 40 on it, I'll let you do corrections and we'll work that out. Uh, if you get a, a B on it, I, for that we don't do corrections so you can get an A on every test because then every student would do that and there'd be no time. This is for students that are struggling. It's not for students that are succeeding. Now, that may not seem fair, but, uh, but not every student is, went to as good a high school and is as well prepared. Um, I admit some students work harder than others, and uh, but generally speaking, that that works out in the wash. The students that work hard usually get the A's. Students that work reasonably hard get B's, and the students that don't really put the effort in may come out with a C. And that's usually how it works out, even when I help you. So don't be jealous that I'm helping some of the struggling students. Uh, just you know, if you really have an issue with that, you can talk to me. But I, I, just, I just want you to know, not, a, not everybody comes with the same a set of tools to logic design. This is, your, this is really probably your first real engineering class. And uh, so now you're in the, the major you really want to do. And y you may need a little help to get up to speed. Uh, and I don't mind doing that. I will help you. I don't want anybody to flunk. So if you need help, let me know. You can get help. That we have a student success center, we have tutors, we have all sorts of stuff at UTSA, and there's no excuse. Everybody here is at least calc ready or in calc, and that means you can cut the mustard. If you can do calculus, you can do logic design. It is not, it's not logic, it's, it's not a intellectually super difficult course. What's difficult about logic design is if you get behind, you are screwed. You have to stay up because you can't guess and get the answer. You have to know, you have to understand what's going on, and you have to be able to, to apply what you know to make it make sense. All right, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into uh, the material for unit one, and <clears throat> It's uh, we're 38 minutes into this. I'll probably I'll probably just go another five or six minutes, but I want to get started. Um, I I have added material to Unit One that's not really in the book, but I will cover it on the test in all possibility in all probability. So it is relevant. I've added it because the book is a little bit dated, um, and believe it or not, I'm in the process of writing another book, which we'll probably use in the fall of next year, um, and it'll be a fully online book with uh, you know videos and all sorts of crazy stuff, hopefully. Uh, so, um, okay. So, uh, it is a pretty readable text, though, I will say that. Just a little dated. Um, I, I do want you to start right off the bat thinking about project groups, and along with that, uh, I'm going to try and use the bulletin board. So, I'd like each of you to do a little, uh, to just write a little self-description. And uh, I'll try and have the bulletin board set up so you can post it on the bulletin board, uh, kind of introducing yourself. And I'd like you to get that done this week. Um, uh, the uh, I say two projects here. I've always wanted to add a second project. Maybe I'll be able to do that this semester, although I don't think this is the semester to try and do that because we're already we're already starting up, you know, with some uh, handicaps because of COVID. 
Uh, but we'll do one project for sure, four to five people or group. Already you should start thinking about your group and who you might get in it. And not being in class is going to make that tricky. Uh, so you need to be on the lookout uh, if you have any on-campus activities. Or, or maybe you just need it on some of the live Zooms. Maybe I'll have a Zoom where you can just try and hook up and, and uh, maybe everybody can go around and introduce themselves. And you can, I don't know, maybe I'll just assign groups. We'll have to see how this plays out. But we definitely will form up in the group. So you can be thinking about if, if there are four or five of you that form a group, that'll be fine. And maybe I'll have some groups self-form and then I'll, I'll put everybody else in other groups arbitrarily. Um, remember, you need to carry your load in the group. Otherwise, your reputation uh, will already begin to be headed in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, one of the ways you can get an extra course point is by doing a hardware uh, and this is in the syllabus, by doing a hardware uh, implementation of your group project. And, and I can help you with the hardware, or if you have a MyDAC from, uh, from the Intro to Engineering course uh, still, or whatever, then you can use that. Um, we will do practice tests for all the midterms. Uh, I'll do a practice test for the Quinney McCluskey quiz. Uh, we'll do, I really do believe in that, although in this format, I won't necessarily take a class period to do them. I'll probably still do a lecture for that day and then you can just do the online practice thing or uh, I'll give it to you it may not be online in the sense that it's graded online yeah it may be one of the one of the tests I one of the written tests I used to use and uh, but I'll try and give you a little a few hints about the online tests maybe I'll give maybe a short three or four question example of some of the online questions because it's a pain to write those things all right um, so uh, we went over how the points are going to be computed uh, again, uh, I haven't gotten the TA all lined up, so I don't know what that's going to be. So until you hear specifically from the TA, I don't know uh, what, how that's going to go down. But usually, what the, what I recommend that they do is set a, is create a Zoom session, and then you can you can join the Zoom session or not. Uh, I don't generally require attendance uh, at the uh, recitations, but uh, if the if the TA works problems for you that will be helpful to you and so you should try you should go to some and see how they work and hopefully we'll get that going if not this week we'll get it going for sure by next week um, again so the course is straightforward foundational don't get behind because you will be lost uh, because you can't make this stuff up it you have to learn it <laughs> this is not one you can guess uh, it logic is very logic design is very cut and dried there's only one, there's, well, there may be, they're, they're not identical equivalent answers often, but th you can't guess and get the right answer. That doesn't work. All right. Um, okay, and I talked about homework. Um, you have to turn it in online. You can turn it in, you can scan it, and then you can paste the JPEG into a Word document or a PDF, but it must be turned in as a word or a PDF. It cannot be turned in as a as a as an image by itself. Don't do that. You, you won't get graded. You'll lose points. Um, so, and I used to do. We used to turn in on paper, but uh, Blackboard is so much better. It never gets lost. There's a date time stamp on when it got turned in, so there's no no debate about whether you turned it in on time or not. Um, so you can turn it in one week late for half off. It'll, if, it'll still count, okay, but if you get all those right, you'll get full credit. But think about it. Let's say you've got your homework 80% done. Turn it in on time, and then let's say you miss a problem. Now you've still got 70%. 70 you're still going to get 100% credit. Whereas if you turn it in late, now if you miss one problem, you get no credit. Turn it in on time, even if it's incomplete. Uh I will cover all the material in lecture before the homework's due, and the due dates are all in the syllabus. They will also be on the turn-in links, but they're not on the turn-in links yet. I haven't updated them, but I will do that. Uh, it, it, it's tedious, and it takes me takes me hours to get that done, but I will try to get that done uh, this week. So before the first homework's due, all the due dates should be updated and set correctly. Um, the answers are probably all on check anyway. This is mostly an, is an issue of you doing the work to learn to help you learn the material um, we're not going to take attendance 
in recitation or in lecture. There will be no attendance. Okay. Again, the course is a three-part course. There's an introduction, and uh, I, I kind of talked about this. The, I didn't talk about the other two parts. The middle part of the course is combinational design. And uh, this basically, the fundamental part of this is taking a truth table and turning it into hardware. And in various types of two-layer networks and simplifying it as best you can uh, so that you get the optimal solution. Sequential design, it takes combinational designs, adds to that uh, memory elements in the form of flip-flops, and create state machines, where we where we basically have uh, have a system in combinational design, where our outputs only depend on the current inputs. In sequential design, the outputs depend on the current inputs, and some maybe extensive or maybe very little past history of previous inputs. So the sequential designs all have some kind of memory, and that memory is usually encoded as the state the machine is in. So that's why we call them state machines. Are sequential designs. Those are the three parts. You're, we're in the first part today, and uh, w once we finish the first exam, we'll be in the second part. Once we finish the second midterm, we'll be in the third part, and we'll cover. We'll, ha uh, we'll have a comprehensive final that will cover it all. Um, we're going to use some things, some terms, as we go along, talking about how we manage complexity, and talking about layers of abstraction. And I'm just going to talk uh, very quickly about this. Um, you'll also find that your group project will really help the combinational design portion of the course make sense. Uh, okay, layers of abstraction. So, what what this is a this is a dis discipline of design where we we hide away details that can be distracting and confusing when we don't really need to see them, and we focus on the part we need to work on which is the higher level stuff. Now, you can see an example of this. Your grandmother can probably send emails. She doesn't have clue one about what's going on underneath that application. And she probably doesn't even have great facility with the application. She's just learned a few basic commands within a single application. But, so here's grandma using her email. There it is. That's what grandma sees, her little email or Outlook window or whatever kind of email it is. But here's what's going on. So you have the Outlook program, it's running on Windows with a whole bunch of other apps at the same time. Then there are these, uh, these DLLs that uh, maybe helping uh, with the keyboard interface, the mouse, uh, bringing information on and off the disk, saving files, retrieving them. Um, then there's the, the graphical user interface that Windows is providing uh, and the DLLs uh, bring up all the drivers and make that work. And then when you get ready to print the email out, uh, now you have to have you have to convert the the characters in the email. They're probably in ASCII. You have to convert them into fonts and actually uh, get the printer to put them on a page. Uh, you have to send all those commands out. All these DLLs are connected with lower, like the keyboard, mouse, and so forth. They have lower level drivers that are actually talking directly to the hardware and bringing the information in so that the DLL can pass it to the application through the through the OS. And then you have uh, then you have chips and and logic gates, and you have actual uh, integrated circuits down here that are working. Within the integrated circuits, you have transistors, connections. Within the uh, within those, you have the the uh, the electronics and the quantum physics that's at work to make the transistors work on your integrated circuit. There's a lot going on that grandma doesn't see, and that's what we mean by layers of abstraction. There are a lot of layers of abstraction here. Normally, what we do it's a discipline. We, we need, to, let's say you're going to write a DLL, great. You have to know about the application and the operating system, but you don't necessarily have to know too much about these lower level drivers. You can just send, in, you can send calls, you can send data and receive data, and there's protocols for that, but you don't have to worry about writing these drivers or how they're actually implemented in hardware or how the, the individual parts of the hardware work or anything about the, the quantum theory behind the, 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 the chip, the, Transistors that have been uh, created on these on these wave, silicon wafers. So that's what we mean by layers of abstraction. This is critical. We we cannot do the complex designs we do if we didn't 
uh, hide away some of the details and allow us to work at different levels of abstraction depending on what we're trying to do. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this, but we're basically just reducing choices uh, to down to the ones we really need to deal with and not worrying about all the stuff we don't need to deal with so that we can actually focus. And this is critical when we have a very complex design. And most of our, most of our you know, major electronic stuff, very complex. So we need to, we need to use this design discipline of uh, layers of abstraction. Some other ways we deal with complexity, we talk about hierarchy, which is, which is you can also think of that a little bit as layers of abstraction. That's really how the hierarchy works. Um, we also try and break everything we're doing into modules so that we can understand the pieces of it without having to get, uh, with, with being able to focus on just that module and making sure that we know what has to go in and what has to come out and connect other things. But once we get that module done, all the internal complexity of that module can be hidden away from people using the module and all they have to know is what do I have to put in and what do I get out. Um, and then this regularity, this is another thing. Uh, like for instance when we when we make an integrated circuit, uh, in many cases uh, most if not all but uh, certainly a lot of the transistors on that circuit are exactly identical. And that just makes building it a whole lot simpler. Now there might be a few special driver transistors that take higher power uh, for driving the output pins and things like that. There may there there may be some exceptions tucked in there, but we make those as infrequent as possible so that we can take advantage of the of the of the help that regularity gives us. And that's that's one of that's another one of the principles. So hierarchy, modularity, regularity. These are real con real, real key tools for dealing with complexity. Um, all right, I think I'm going to stop. We're going to talk about uh, uh, we're going to talk about the definition of digital, and and sort of uh, what we deal. But in this course, we're going to deal with uh, the digital world where all our signals are basically all our bits anyway only can have one or two one of two values zero or one. True or false is another way to think of it because they're not really numeric values, and we'll explain the difference between digital. And analog, and and why uh, doing things in the digital domain has become the only, almost exclusively what we use, unless there's no way to avoid using the analog, and that's usually restricted nowadays to just the transducers that connect to the real world, because a lot of the real world stuff is still in the analog mode. All right, we'll stop there. I we will. Uh, there'll be another video. There'll be a quiz for this video, and there'll be another video on Wednesday for you to do.